Well, glory to Jesus Christ. It's Monday, the the 15th, the 15th of, of June, 2020. And we're on our reading of the Catechism on the section on prayer, which is part of part four. And we're on Jesus teaching us to pray on that. So this, for those following along with the Catechism, this is paragraph 2607 of section four, part four, uh, article two. So we can say a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. And we can pray our prayer to the Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who instructed the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant that by the gift of the same Spirit we may be always truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So this is 2607. Jesus teaches us how to pray. When Jesus prays, he is already teaching us how to pray. His prayer to the Lord is the theological path, the theologal from logos meaning and theo of God. So this is the way of we're walking according to the theological virtues of faith, hope, and love. The path of faith, hope, and charity. This path of our prayer to God. But the gospel also gives us Jesus' explicit teaching on prayer. Like a wise teacher, he takes hold of us where we are and leads us progressively toward the Father. Addressing the crowds following him, Jesus builds on what they already know of prayer from the Old Covenant and opens to them the newness of the coming kingdom. Then he reveals this newness to them in parables. Finally, he will speak openly of the Father and the Holy Spirit to his disciples who will be the teachers of prayer in his church. Well, of course, the in the Old Testament, if you want to find the eternal Son and the eternal Holy Spirit, you really have to look in, in reading this. And you have to read it according to apostolic tradition, not according to the Mosaic way of viewing this. And, and you'd have, you have to read in a, in a spiritual sense often as, as i said reading the scripture before reading the scripture is always in the context of the apostolic tradition and in the church and is to be under the holy spirit to be open to the holy spirit because the scriptural text isn't just any old text it's the uh, written tradition the written, uh, aspects of the written tradition the crystallization of good portions of the apostol oral tradition, the apostolic tradition. And so it's scripture in tradition in the church under the Holy Spirit. And of course, in the openness to the other revelation, the primal revelation, which is natural law, coming out to that. And then we have the special revelation in Holy, in holy tradition, then Holy Scripture, you have first the Old Testament, because first the oral tradition is 
what we call the Mosaic tradition of, uh, after Moses that was handed down over the generations, over the centuries, over the millennia even, uh, of the God working among us and God inspiring, God directing that according to his way. Because you and I would have probably done it different ways. You know, with scripture, I, I, if I if we're up to, I would have put everything in scripture, I feel like abs, every jot and tittle. But the problem with the text, even the inspired text, is that it's ultimately static. So that's why you need this living tradition in there with that. So this doesn't put down the inspiration of Holy Scripture. I think it rather elevates it. So Jesus prays. So that's a big thing about it. So some people say, why would Jesus pray? Isn't he God? Yes, he's God. He's God incarnate. But the persons of the Trinity are in total communication constantly. So now with this new aspect that the eternal word taking on himself a human nature and the human condition, the canonic condition, that's a fancy word for the, the he poured himself out, he emptied himself, he embraced the poverty of creaturehood, he embraced the poverty of a, the particular situation he was in, the, the family, the poverty of his particular DNA and all this stuff, the limitations that are involved in that, without actually limiting his divine person, but embracing this limitation at the same time. It sounds, isn't that a contradiction? No, it's a paradox. You're truly God, truly human, one person. So he teaches, so he's a wise teacher. Rabbi is the, the very common address of Jesus in the Gospels, teacher. And so he has explicit teachings on prayer, as well as the example, his example of praying to the Father so often, and even going aside in, in private with him. With that. Of course, the Trinity, there is, there's no division. It's, they're totally united, yet they're truly distinct from each other. They're truly, each person, or hypothesis, use the fancy word, is truly his own person. Yet, they're totally one being. There's no division. There's no separation. So, he takes hold of us where we are. So God does that in prayer. Where we are. He comes to us where we are. And we pray the way we are. And yes, we draw from the masters of prayer, and especially with liturgy, the liturgical prayer, draw, drawing from that, to be inspired and drawn on, especially when we can't think of saying something, and then the, this saint has said it, or this uh, liturgical hymn or prayer has said it. And so we, we pray that. We make that ours personally, because it's ours corporately. And we pray because praying is not just praying in your in your prayer closet there and pray praying in a, absolute privacy but also praying publicly which is the highest form of objective prayer uh, in the mass especially Jesus builds on what they already know of prayer from the old covenant so the apostles they had an experience of this. We don't know how well educated they were in the liturgical traditions of, of the temple and synagogue, uh, but they had some connection. Uh, Galileans were often looked down on by Judeans as not, you know, knowing as much of that and, and that uh, about the faith and all that. And of course, Pharisees looked down on people who weren't Pharisees. And I bet the Sadducees did the same thing. 
looking down on people who weren't Sadducees. Uh, it's interesting, uh, two people looking down their nose at each other of all this. But the Lord usually went with the poor and even the uneducated. The uh, prophet Amos is commemorated today on uh, some calendars in the, in the Catholic Church. And he was someone, he said, I'm, I, you know, I wasn't trained as a prophet. I didn't get my MDiv in prophetic school. I, you know, didn't, I'm not a, you know, I'm not a sponsored prophet. He said, I'm a dresser of sycamores. I'm a shepherd. I'm a, a nobody in your eyes. But these people who are nobodies in the eyes of the world were very important in God's eyes. So we were all very important in God's eyes. We're all unique, as the bumper sticker says, you're unique, just like everybody else. We're all unique in our own way. And are infinitely and eternally loved by God. So God takes us where we are, but then he leads us as more. So that there's so much to build on in the old, the, uh, the, uh, the Jewish tradition, the, uh, the pre-Christian tradition, the, the tradition before Jesus, because Jesus is in the Jewish tradition of prayer, the, you know, the Psalms, all the, the, the ritual, the, the pilgrimages of the temple, all, of all sorts of things. The uh, developing synagogue institution, as a, not just a place of assembly, not just a place of study, but as a place of prayer, it's a situation of prayer. So that's going on, and, that, and they're all involved in this to some degree. We don't know how much you know, they, they were, but they all were. And they seem to know pretty, pretty, a lot of the stuff pretty well. And so he says, he opens to them the newness of the coming kingdom. So uh, revealing new, what seems to be new anyway, perspectives on passages in the Old Testament. Jesus explains to the disciples at God Emmaus, explains all the typology, that is, the, all the stuff prefiguring him, thing, the prophecies he fulfills, and in ways that many didn't read. Not everybody read all the things that the early Christians read, or that Jesus read, as Jesus fulfilling them. Like, let's say the suffering servant in Isaiah 53 there. Uh, that was not considered a messianic prophecy by many Jews at the time. But Jesus fulfills this according to the perspective that he gives them the, in these disciples and other disciples as time goes on, and ultimately passed down to us. Then he reveals this newness to them in parables. So that was an often favored teaching method of many rabbis. Because we remember stories more than we remember abstract theses. We, you know, we remember the story. It's, it's like a lot of these commercials. I remember the commercial. I don't remember what they were for. Or, or what they were, so if the object was to get me to buy whatever they had failed, but at least I remember what the, what the commercial was, the story in the commercial, or the funny thing that happened in the commercial. So Jesus uses these parables, which are not just bare illustrations, but they're calls to decision. So you get invested in this parable. You have often have to decide. Take, you know, the example of the the Good Samaritan parable, for example, you know, where, who is my neighbor? You have to, you have to participate in this. And the, uh, the prodigal son parable, you know, am I going to be like the older son? Am I going to stay outside or what? Because it doesn't finish. We don't know if the older son goes in to the, the feast for the, uh, the, the son who, uh, done so much damage, but now is brought back, who is penitent and is brought back. So uh, the, 
Finally, he will speak openly of the Father and the Holy Spirit to his disciples, who will be the teachers of prayer in his church. So Jesus promises the Holy Spirit, this other counselor, advocate, this parakletos, who will be there for them, this other co uh, that, uh, speaking up for them and be there with them. In fact, the Holy Spirit will make Jesus more present to them than he was before his crucifixion and resurrection. And even then, in his resurrected state, he said, I must leave so that the Holy Spirit can come and do the work that needs to be done. And so we see then in the book of Acts that this sort of gospel of the Holy Spirit, that the apostles are doing the miracles that Jesus did, and then they're now teaching with Paresia, they're teaching with this, this confident, this, this bold confidence there. And uh, the, the Holy Spirit is presenting Jesus still ministering, still doing miracles, still teaching, still resolving. So when they have the Council of Jerusalem about the decision, what it, with this movement, is it going to be a Jewish sect? Some sort of messianic Jewish sect? Or is it going to be Catholic? Is it going to be universal? Is it going to be for everybody uh, without having people to become Jewish in that sense, in the, the sense of observing all the mitzvot, all the customs, all the regulations of, of that? So, of course, the, the moral law there is not only preserved, but reformed and intensified, made much more demanding. The Beatitudes are much more demanding than the Ten Commandments. So, the disciples will be the teachers of prayer in his church. So, this it is to be uh, not just, especially the apostles and, and the successors, the bishops, uh, should be real teachers, uh, not only of, of the doctrine of the church, but of spirituality in the church, presenting this, not only as the chief liturgician, the chief presider in a diocese, but they should be really presenters of a, a way of prayer, of, of, of different ways of prayer, as there are in the church. So 2608, from the Sermon on the Mount onwards, the Sermon on the Mount, we're in, you, reading that in the Gospels of the, uh, these weeks in ordinary time, the uh, week, you know, 10, uh, uh, 10 and 11, and on because that that the sermon about is Matthew five chapter five through chapter seven and then there are uh, sort of things that pop up throughout the Gospels uh, that seem to be reflecting that way of Jesus is the new Moses with the I you have heard it this from the old law but now I tell you this you uh, you, uh, you uh, love your neighbor your kinsman hate your enemy, but now I tell you, love your enemy. So Jesus uh, reforms, intensifies, and there are some things that are just uh, the, the barbarisms and stuff like that, that are the old uh, Iron Age uh, vendetta stuff and the uh, uh, brutal militancy that often you get from that, and the harshness of many of these these laws that's abolished, and of course we as Gentile, most of the church will be the, the church will be Gentile. We're never under these uh, these customs anyway. So we have a new thing. We have our adaptation. We don't have circumcision. We have baptism. We have uh, all of these other things. But then we appropriate because we, as to use the image of Saint Paul, are a wild olive grafted onto the cultivated all of, of Israel, of the tradition of Judaism. So uh, as, as someone once said, and as I often repeat, uh, a Christian who hates Judaism is a child who hates his mother. And a, a Protestant who hates Catholicism is a child who hates his mother. That's, uh, I don't know who said that first, but that is true. 
And of course, to say a few, uh, a Catholic who hates the, the totality of Protestantism, well, he's hating his own heritage. He's hating at least 80%, if not 90% of the Catholic heritage uh, that's there. Because there are objections. We do have objections to the very things. Because we have to remember the Prod Protestantisms are very, very diverse. It's not all. But some people say, oh, all Protestants, X. Well, it's usually not the case. It's not the case. Uh, especially in what negative things saying about you know, all of, as if, you know, often they'll pick something from some extreme and, and then generalize. That we see that as Catholics also, that people try to do that, but the behavior of an individual Catholic, even if it's totally contrary to the teachings of the church, the morality of the church, everything, the uh, attitude of Christ as the head of the church, uh, they say, oh, that's, that's what a real Catholic is like. That's what real Catholicism is, but it's not. So, and we, we as Catholics should not do that to our fellow Christians and say, well, this is that, unless, you know, right there in their confessions or something like that, that this is right there in context. Because that's another thing, but if quoting these, they should be quoted in context, not pulled out uh, with the a paradigm of malice, which some people say, well, I'm going to prove that uh, these people, whatever they are, whatever group, they're just, you know, uh, wicked and totally deluded and all that, and that uh, these people, as Trinitarian as they may be, are not, quote unquote, really Christian. So, because as Catholics, we get that all the time from fundamentalists and and, 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 so, and some others. Uh, but eh, we know that's not the case. We know that we, as Catholics, we firmly believe that we have the fullness of the Christianity and that they've uh, left some out. Some have left only a little out, others have left a lot out. And we really need to dialogue, we really need to understand what we're saying. And I won't even say both sides because there are so many sides in the, the Protestant perspective. So, our brothers, our separated brethren, as they say, but let's work that we are less and less separated. So the Sermon on the Mount on, but Jesus insists on conversion of heart. So often when we think of conversion, we think of you know changing a denomination or changing a religion or something. But it means turning with. So here it is, it's the, the turning of the heart. And we as Catholics don't just believe in a single jolt sort of conversion, which does happen. We've looked at the lives of many saints, they were very... Uh, dramat often dramatic conversions at St. Paul, for example. But conversion is an ongoing process, a constant growth in this constant turning to the Lord, constant uh, development, constant maturing. And then we may have dips, but so we need to get ourselves off, uh, put ourselves back on our feet, dust ourselves off, and continue to walk in the narrow way of the Lord by the power of his grace. So conversion of heart. Heart here does, doesn't just mean emotion. In fact, you can have true conversion of heart and not be particularly involved emotively in the thing. Some people are very emotive, some people aren't. aren't. It doesn't mean the people who aren't emotive that their conversion of heart is necessarily any less. Uh, it's the will the will. First of all, it's by the grace of God, by the, the, this gift of God, by the power of his energies that he pours out. And then a response to that and continue, continual, and let's hope continue us, response to grace as we grow more and more in that. And we get to see more uh, of ourselves, to see our faults more. To see things, you know, that we who just uh, didn't even notice a way back, or even thought such and such a thing was good, such and such an attitude uh, was was good, and then we look now and say, well, that attitude was just totally lacking in charity, totally lacking in in reliance on God's grace. Even if I was saying it was, you know, all about grace and all about truth and all about all this other stuff. 
often we just don't get it. But the Lord is helping us in this continual conversion of heart to get it more and more. Reconciliation with one's brother before presenting an offering at the altar. So Jesus does that. He says, before you present the offering at the in the temple, you remember that go and be right. And, and that's a sort of humorous image. You say you've been waiting in line with your your sheep or whatever all the time. And then you remember that you really need to be reconciled. And then you just leave it. You just run out and uh, to be reconciled. That's how important uh, seeking reconciliation is. Now, there are times in which our reconciliation is going to have to be one way. The other person is not going to be interested in it. Some people will, you know, will still be hostile or whatever, whatever it is. But we have to make sure that we have our own inner reconciliation, which involves forgiveness and, and often involves repentance on our own part and, and uh, acting out in healing for whatever in, in that, that way. And so, uh, and of course, sometimes the best route of reconciliation with some people is to avoid that person completely. Uh, pray for the person and all that. You know, if, you, if you're just going to fight somebody every time you see the person, or uh, or even you know totally judge the person, and loathe the person, that you're you're better off doing good for that person from a distance. The preference is to be really reconciled and even emotionally reconciled, but that doesn't always happen. So, and we, but we still have to persevere in doing this. And also praying if, if someone has died, it's not as if, well, that's the end, we can't, you know, in the communion of saints, we can be reconciled. We can forgive people who've gone on. We can be healed of what they've done to us or, uh, or what we've done uh, in, in that we can be, or that death is not the slamming of the door when it comes to that. Love of enemies. So that's a hard thing, you know. Love your kinsmen and, and love those who do good things, but love your enemies. And Jesus said, even people who have no, no foot in the covenant, totally ignorant to this, said even they do good to those who do good to them. Well, if they're decent people, that is. Because there are plenty of people who do evil to those who do good to them. Uh, but love of enemies, how crucial that is, and how important that is in prayer as a, an intention of prayer of reconciliation as an intention of prayer, as loving, forgiving and loving your enemies. Because sometimes that's where this really starts concretely, by praying for the enemies, praying for them. But we still can't, you know, abide the sight of them or even the thought of them. Pray for them. Pray for the good for them. Pray for their conversion of heart. Pray for their transformation that they might have ultimate happiness, even if we're praying through gritted teeth initially. We need to pray that. We need to make that act of the will of that forgiveness. Not that we place ourselves in situations where we'll be exploited again or crushed again or even perhaps destroyed by these, an unconverted enemy. Again, converted here, I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about transformation of life, transformation of attitude. In the power of God's grace. And then prayer for those who persecute us. That's even harder than for people who have done real harm to us to pray for that. There's a, there's a person I knew of in uh, suffered a great deal in uh, Iraq from uh, persecution from you know ISIS people and all, and all sorts of uh, radical jihadist Islamist fanatics and a lost a great deal lost relatives lost everything all the property or whatever they had to flee altogether this stuff was destroyed 
and they were in a camp. They would know no one was really accepting them at the time. But this person made that act of the will of the forgiveness of all these people who had done this. People who weren't in the slightest repentant. And if they could get a hold of this person would probably slit his throat. But he prayed for the forgiveness of them, for their conversion to God according to God's will. For their, their that they might uh, become authentically religious people, that they might honor God the merciful and the compassionate, and prayed for them, for the persecutors, and then prayer to the Father in secret. Now, some people think, oh, that means that you shouldn't have any public prayer. You or, and or, or your good works too. You should always everything should be always totally anonymous. Well, that actually isn't what Jesus is saying, because Jesus elsewhere says, you know, uh, uh, make public your good works Why? so that people will praise you, know that they might glorify the Father in heaven. So uh, motives make a big, uh, a big difference. And to, to, uh, to be an example to people. So uh, we look at the saints, at their good work, their self-sacrifice their acts of faith, their application of faith, because that's what a Christian good work would be, an application of faith, an uh, application of hope, an application of love. That's, that's what, what, otherwise it's, no matter how superficially good it might be or beneficial to somebody, it, it doesn't have the substance of love in it. It doesn't have the outflowing from authentic faith. So pray to the Father in secret. That's a good thing to do. That we really need to develop that private talking to God, one-on-one, -on -one, or thinking, practicing that presence of God with all the time. But also not to the neglect of communal prayer. It was like people say, "Why well, can commune with God more, pray to God more on the golf course?" But I usually say, would say, then rather than go to church on Sundays, and I would say, "Oh, do you really?" Be honest. No, I said you need you need the mass. You need public worship. You need to pray with other people. You need to hear the scriptures proclaimed in the context of liturgy. You need all of this. Because this is in, we don't worship God. We don't attend to the sacraments of Christ. We don't uh, ponder His scriptures for God's benefit. But for ours, it's God who's outpouring upon us. Nor should we go primarily to these things to be entertained. We say, well, I prefer to go to such and such church because it's more entertaining. No, I should go to such and such a church because the truth is more fully presented. That worship is is more profound to me rather than that. So, uh, you know, but. Uh, Exercise your tastes, sure, but you're doing it to worship God, not to uh, for you to get some some sort of high out of something or whatever. I just said to be entertained. There was a Scottish Presbyterian one time who was the person was complaining about their worship that you know complete you know they didn't have you know strobe lights and blah 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 and they weren't. Uh, using this and that and the other thing. And he said, you know, it's not, and he said, we are not here to be entertained by God. We are here to entertain God. Not that God needs it, but we need to praise God. We need the worship of God. We need the thanksgiving to God. For our sake, God is totally, eternally and infinitely sufficient in himself. He doesn't need us, but he, out of love, wants us. He put, calls us in to participate, to be channels of salvation and healing to others. The salvation won by Christ alone. To be brought to others. To be participants in this. To be fellow workers with God, as St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians.
not heaping up empty phrases, you know, pr pr prayer trying to impress God, uh, rather than prayer as communication with God, prayer as self-giving to God. Not that uh, repeating prayers, even when you can't even think of them, where your mind is, your intellect is gone, everything seems gone at times. That's tough. There's actually nothing just like a tiny, a short, repeated prayer over and over and over. Yeah. There are times in which that's real. Because there's such a variety in prayer, in the diet of prayer. You know, in a diet, if you go, to your doctor, your nutritionist, to get a diet. And the person will, you know, you want, a, he wants, he or she wants you to have a balanced diet. You know, the, the right amount of protein that you need, and there's you know, the good carbs and all that, the, uh, the, the fat that you have, not saturated fat, but good fat, and this, that, and, you know, eating this, and, uh, uh, and some of this, and some of that, and, Make sure you get your roughage and all this other stuff. And that can be an analogy to the prayer life, too. Like we need these different types of prayer, different experiences of prayer, different modes of prayer, different, as in, in a relationship. So you're, you're relating to your husband or wife. So you're doing it on different levels. You have these different way, modes of communication, different ways of, of living with the other person. And so it's, this is true of God, but in some ways it's even greater with God because God pervades everything. And the relationship with God is to pervade absolutely everything also. Every other relationship with every person and thing. Prayerful forgiveness from the depth of the heart. How crucial that is. Praying for a deeper and deeper ability to forgive. It may take years, decades, to really get to that point, uh, emotionally even, to get the, <clears throat> but we're not going to wait for the emotion in forgiveness. Well, we're going to start with the will. As I said, even if it's with two gritted teeth, we're going to be starting with the will, that is to say, grace starting on our will and our cooperating with that grace. Purity of heart. That's one of the Beatitudes. That's the being really single-minded, really set on God. But asking God, again in prayer, for greater purification of our motives. Our motives in coming to God, in being in God. Our motives in relating with other people. Even our motives in relating to ourselves, within ourselves. Seeking the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom before all else. So it doesn't mean just seek the kingdom and that's, and that's that. But the kingdom above all. Because in the kingdom of heaven, living as citizens of heaven here on earth, even, that all is contained. So And, and also, we can lose everything, but if we have that citizenship of heaven, we still ultimately have everything, everything that means means anything. All that's going to last. If we have God, we have all that lasts, the infinite and the eternal. And growing in that growing, this constant growth and working in growth by God's grace in that relationship, in that conversion of heart. This filial, filial meaning uh, as a son or daughter, conversion is entirely directed to the Father. So we're going to God the Father, through the Son, in the Holy Spirit. It's all a Trinitarian experience in reality. 2609. Once committed to conversion, the heart learns to pray in faith. And what is this faith? It's not just bare belief, as important as that is, and we should always be cultivating our belief, our knowledge of God, knowledge about God, and especially knowledge of him experientially. Faith is a filial, again, a son or daughter, adherence to God. So not, uh, and the Christian faith 
the Christian experience of faith, the, this uh, trust that is committed trust is given to faithfulness, fidelity, loyalty, obedience. Faith is a filial adherence to God beyond what we feel. So we can't, we can't make our feelings be the engine in the relationship with God, in the relationship with faith. We should cultivate feelings. You know, the music that moves us, art, all this stuff. Uh, we should cultivate the feelings, the good, positive feelings. We should also cultivate the feeling of sorrow, uh, which is not a pleasant feeling, for our sins but never to be crushed by that. Always to have uh, to know that the Lord is giving that, we are, that gift of joy in the Lord. So let the joy of the Lord be my strength in this, even in my sorrow, even in my grief, even in my struggle, even in the doldrums of life, even when everything is blah, nothing seems to be going anywhere. That's there we, by faith, again, it's by faith, not our, by our feeling, that we acknowledge that the, that gift of the joy of the Lord is there. Beyond what we feel and beyond what we understand. So we bring our whole intellect into this enterprise of relationship with God. So always that, you know, the questioning, but it's the questioning in faith, think uh, there is an answer. You, O oh God, are the answer, and I'm at it, But I'm going to continue to pursue this, to you know, to be a uh, fides querens intellectum, faith seeking understanding. To use uh, Saint uh, Anselm's turn, I believe it's Saint Anselm's uh, phrase, but it's also the other way around: the intellect seeking faith to grow grow in this relationship with God. And our faith is not to be just blind. Because there are some things, the less, there, there are some people's faith is just simply anti-intellectual. That it's, uh, you know, that uh, if there's some, uh, something that, uh, the intellect is just totally Define. I'm not talking about transcending the intellect or paradox or something like uh, you know the God the incarnation or something. Uh, I'm talking about things like uh, you know that uh, I'm going to make uh, some aspect of a religious tradition define the approach to science to approach the the physical sciences I'm talking about and uh, the and the conclusions of it. So no, the Bible is not to be used as some sort of science textbook. The Bible, as was said during the Galileo controversy, shows how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. So it's a, mi a misuse of scripture for, to use it for that. Yes, of course, you, scripture may be helpful in, in history and archaeology, if it can be verified from other sources, or it could be that that can be that can be really really useful. But it's you know we should be depending on empirical sciences and things like that for the uh, the physical sciences, and we shouldn't be using the uh, empirical sciences to determine our morality as. Uh, uh, Nazi intellectuals did, and other uh, communist intellectuals often did that. The, the, no, there's no real right or wrong, and then uh, if you know we can get away with this, or if this can be done by science, then it should be done. You know, it, just because we can blow up the planet doesn't mean we should do it. Quite the opposite. Science is a great help, but it cannot be the savior with a capital S. Only God can do that. There's no real conflict between authentic religion and faith and authentic science, the physical sciences. After all, theology is a 
ciencia, a science, a knowledge. So it just often goes beyond our understanding. That we're willing to take that step forward. That you, with the, taking our intellect with us, taking our will with us, taking our emotions with us. It is possible because the beloved son gives us access to the father. So we have access to God through God, who's become one of us, in the power of God, the Holy Spirit, who is poured upon us. Again, this is a Trinitarian experience. So we, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life that we accept it. He can ask us to seek and to knock, since he himself is the door and the way. Matthew 7, 7 through 11. 13 to 14. So we believe through trusting in Jesus and that, that he who seeks finds. That he's not going to slam the door of us or deprive us of that. He's not going to give us the, the curiosity and the yearning for that and not give a way for it to be fulfilled. This, he does not deny grace. out of some eternal plan. No, God wishes to pour his grace upon everyone. So we're, we're floating in an ocean of grace, but so often human beings are dying of thirst, spiritual thirst, moral thirst, ethic, uh, all sorts of spiritual thirsts. But Jesus is there, Jesus is there, the water of life, the Holy Spirit is there to fulfill us in this. And he's given us the way. We don't have to invent our own way. We don't have to find, find our way. Jesus is the way. And so Jesus has given us his church. He's given us his Holy Spirit. He's given us all of the means through the church, the scripture, the tradition, well, the, uh, the, the tradi spiritual tradition, various schools of spirituality uh, that, are, that, that are often very different, that can be very fruitful according to a person's personality, according to so many other things. Not that we should just hone in on one school and ignore all the others. You know, why uh, just eat one course of the dinner? Once, once committed to conversion. So this is, it, it takes commitment and perseverance in commitment. So those who seek find, those who knock, have the door open to them. And there's the catechism points out here from scripture. Since he himself is the door, that's a, one of the I am sayings, the ego I be sayings of Jesus. I am a door, I am the way. And so when some people try to use that when Jesus says, I'm the bread of life, that he said, oh, well, that doesn't mean the real presence of the Eucharist. It doesn't mean he's actually, you know, substantially present in, 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 this, in the Eucharist. They try to say that. And they try to make the image of, so he says he's a door, but he's not literally a door. And I remember when some, someone said, well, he says he's the way. I said, oh, well, he is literally the way. He is literally the truth. He is literally literally the life and uh but uh i think in a an open reading open to the whole context of john 6 especially the latter part of it you know with the with the 50s and 60s there the verses uh, that we really see that he's really saying i am as the bread of life, and he says, my flesh, the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world, which he says earlier, and then he says, my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed, in truth.
2610. Justin, or maybe a developing tradition at the time, but the tradition of the barakot, of the, the blessings of the thanksgivings, of all this stuff, the, the, the Jewish tradition in which say, Baruch Ato Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaFavon, Blessed are you, Lord God, King of the universe, for something, for a particular thing, for the fruit of the earth, for uh, when you, you see uh, something beautiful, it says, uh, Blessed are you, Lord God, King of the earth, who has placed such beauty in the world. Well, all sorts of things. There, there are blessings for everything. And, and uh, blessings of God, which means uh, praising God, thanking God, and, and that. Not in a blessing that we add something to it. That's what we say we want to be blessed by God. That's not what we mean when we say we bless God. But just as Jesus prays to the Father and gives thanks before receiving his gifts, and that's a good custom to pray uh, grace, that is thanks, before meals and after meals. It's a good custom to do. My family, we did it privately. We, we, did, we just do it privately. That was the, the, the custom there. Uh, other Many families had a public thing, and they're very public. Uh, the, the, Thanksgiving. Sometimes everybody at the table had to give some little thanks, if you'd see that. There are different family rituals for that. But it's a good as to instill in your children and grandchildren this thanking God for the food and uh, thanking God for everything that he's in charge of it. There's other people who say, <clears throat> well, I earn the money for this food. The I you know thank the people who grew it people who produced it, people who cooked it. But why God? God wasn't. Well, God's the ultimate source of all of this. God is the one who gives the abilities for everyone for this to happen. So he teaches us filial boldness, coming across as the way as a beloved son or daughter would. So we say, well, I... You know, that, so you'd go, you say, you want something, so you say, well, uh, you're, you're the son or daughter, and you say, well, I'm going to go to, as, as, as someone I know that he loves, and I go to him as someone I know he loves, that, that I love, to go to God, to have this boldness there. Not boldness in the sense of, of cockiness or uh, rudeness even, but boldness in really knowing this. Like Mary at the wedding feast of Cana. So she goes right up to Jesus and she doesn't even spell anything out because he apparently knows this. It's a relative thing. You know, they're, they're relatives there. Um, and he says they're probably relatives of Mary. And they said they have no wine, so they've run out, which is a great embarrassment at that thing. Uh, uh, wine is, is a, a blessing in Judaism, and uh, drunkenness, of course, is, is deplored and is the sin. It's the drunkenness that's the sin. It's the losing of ability there. The, but uh, wine itself is was good. In fact, in those days and places, wine was safer than water to drink. But, uh, but people watered down their wine a great deal, often. So, uh, that's, we still have that little ritual at the Mass of putting a drop of uh, water in the wine and uh, became a symbol of the hypostatic union of the unity of Christ and the uh, as a true God and true man. Although that's actually probably not a very good image because the water gets absorbed into the wine. The humanity of Jesus doesn't get absorbed into his divinity. That's uh, an extreme of Eutychian heresy. Fully human, fully God, one person, united. Whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you will receive it and you will. Now that, that's been abused. There are people who try to they, the name it and claim it, sort of the prosperity gospel, as I would say, though. 
you know, claim your island in the Caribbean. And if you have enough faith, you'll get it. And it's really sad with uh, illness, where there are people who, you know, pray for the, the illness you know, to be he physically healed, then they're not. So in addition to having to endure the cross of that illness, now they're made to feel guilty that they didn't have enough faith, that their faith was weak. But that isn't the case. You know, well, many great saints who had faith to move planets, let alone mountains, uh, never got rid of their illnesses that they had. You know, that, so many, often the case. In fact, often the illness was an, well, an occasion of greater reliance on God for many of them, as well as being a cross. For some, of course, it's a, ta it's a, 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 a burden, a, a testing of their faith. But uh, they pull through that in doing. Such is the power of prayer and of faith that does not doubt. All things are possible for him who believes, that who has faith. Math, Mark 9, 23, Matthew 21, 22. Jesus is saddened by the lack of faith of his own neighbors and the little faith of his own disciples. As he is struck with admiration at the great faith of a people who aren't even instructed in this. The Roman centurion with the servant who need to be, and then the Canaanite woman, the Syrophoenician woman with the, the daughter that's possessed. So he marvels at their, their faith that they have. And this, of course, is faith coming out not from their knowledge of the particular revelation of the scripture or the tradition, but from uh, natural law and from the evidence of Jesus being a healer. They have faith that this can be. And, and, and so they have the inner faith, even if they don't have the outer faith. So just as Jesus did that already, 2611, the prayer of faith consists not only in saying, Lord, Lord, it's not just a verbal thing. You know, a parrot can, can do that, uh, you know, can remember. Some people say, oh, you know, they know the scripture very well. Well, well they've memorized, uh, you know, portions of this. And very nice. It's very good. But do they have the meaning of it? Are they applying it? Is this, you know, this? Otherwise, it's just parroting or even perverting. You can just twist scripture uh, to... Uh, The, your your favorite vice to cultivate that, you know, whether it be, you know, hatred of these other people because they don't agree with you or whatever. So you try, and of course you can find plenty of scripture verses to justify your uh, uh, God loved Isaac but hated Esau. They were going to, stuff like that. Again, projecting God in their own image and often the worst qualities you know, they project on God. So that's always a danger. Not in saying, Lord, Lord, but in disposing the heart to do the will of the Father. It's not he who says, Lord, Lord, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. So the dead faith, that, that the, this uh, outer profession, even if it's you know, perfect, even if you know everything, if you're, you're a perfect theology, as James points out, the devils know. The devils are be better theologians than we are. They know the scriptures. They know the tradition. They know everything. They know the history. They know it all a lot better than we ever will. Yet, they do not have saving faith. They don't trust God. It's quite the opposite. They know, but there's no love. They know, but they're not cultivating living faith. The prayer of faith consists not only in saying, Lord, Lord, but in disposing the heart to do the will of the Father by the power of grace. Jesus calls his disciples to bring their prayer into their prayer, this concern for cooperating with the divine plan. So we'll start there, page 26, 12.
2612. So next week we'll look into that. And let's say the Our Father together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. Amen. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's see who's waving. Linda Brasha, Christ is in our midst, he is and always will be. Father Paul Ring, Christ is in our midst, he is and always will be. Judy Walling, Christ is in our midst, he is and always will be. Donna Brown Snugs, Christ is in our midst, he is and always will be. Walter Byrne, Christ is in our midst, he is and always will be. Robert Hart, Christ is in our midst, he is and always will be. Bernard Delory, Christ is in our midst, he is and always will be. Gary Graveline Sr., Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. So let's continue to pray for each other. Have a blessed day. Bye now.